Women to Watch is an intimate look into the lives of prominent and influential women leaders from around the world and the challenges they faced on their journey. It's the real story behind her title. Join us every week to hear more stories about women from around the world and in your own communities at womentowatch.net. Do you stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. For the big story on Action News. Search 6ABC <laughs> Philadelphia and start streaming today. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another week of Women to Watch. I'm Sue Rocco. It's so great to be here with you. Um, we have another great show for you this week. Joining me in just a moment will be Heidi Messer. Heidi is the co-founder and chairperson for Collective Eye, which is an online platform um, supporting sales teams um, utilizing AI, helping them um, optimize their revenue. So it's going to be a really great conversation uh, with Heidi, and she has an incredibly successful professional story. As always, stay with us during the breaks where you'll hear from our corporate partners, Comcast NBC Universal with Carol Eggert bringing you our military watch and Madeline Bell, CEO of Children's Hospital of Philadelphia um, with our CEO watch and Jane Fedoni, president of Penn Community Bank and Sherry Morrison for our lifestyle watch is going to be joined by Laura Taylor today. And Laura is the founder of a company called Mingle Mocktails. So they're non-alcoholic drinks. Um, so now I'm very honored and excited to welcome to the show, Heidi Messer. Hi, nice to see you, Hi. Sue. Great to have you, Heidi. Um, we were chit-chatting before we started recording, and um, I think it'd be nice for the viewers to know that I have, you know, known who you are and followed your work for over 10 years, um, and you've been so gracious in kind of connecting me to other women, um, but I really wanted to get you on the show, and so I finally have. Um, I'm going to turn the tables a little bit because I know um, you have your own um, space where you get to ask questions for some really incredible leaders uh, globally. So today we're going to do that with you. And um, I wanted to start out with your upbringing in Westchester, New York, and have you talk to me a little bit about your mom who I know has been um, a, a, an incredible mentor for you and inspiration. Yeah, she's she's really an amazing woman. I mean, I, I think, you know, you and I are blessed to live in a time where a lot of women paved the way for us to, to do what we're doing. And I sort of had a front row seat to see that happening where, you know, it's very often I walk into the room and I'm definitely in the minority <laughs> Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, my mom would walk into a room and really be the only, the only person, the only woman there. So she actually started off as a teacher and, um, you know, she says in her time, there were three choices. You could be a teacher, a nurse or a secretary. That's what they refer to people who were helping out in offices. And so she chose teacher and, um, and then actually stopped working when my brother and I were born and unfortunately, my father passed away very suddenly of a heart attack at age 41 and had mm -hmm. started a business. And she um, took over his business. It was a business in the real estate space, um, commercial real estate and commercial maintenance, you know, meaning the people who clean buildings and really um, grew his business to three times the size of what it was, but was wow. one of the only single mothers I knew growing up. Um, and you know, they used to call us latchkey kids. Like we would yeah. come home and let ourselves in. So we, I went from having, you know, the, the person who was at home all the time to the person who was working 12 to 14 hour days and, um, and, you know, watching both of those examples and seeing her, you know, do what a lot of people thought was impossible and, and really statistically was impossible, be, you know, successful and raise two children and put them through college and graduate school. Um, she was such an inspiration. She is such an inspiration for me um, to this very I'm day. I'm with you. I'm Incredible. so glad. Yeah. How old were you when you lost your dad? Um, I was 11 and my brother was 10. Wow. So really, um, you know, it was, it was, and we had just moved to a new place and 
it was it was a really really challenging time for our family but you know when i look back and see what it taught us you know i would never if i could you know wave a wand and say like these are the circumstances you're given i would not have picked those circumstances but looking back it actually made us better entrepreneurs it made us a closer family um, my brothers to this day my business partner um mm -hmm. you know just it it shaped so much of of our lives going forward um well, because you had to come together and do what needed to be done. And, you know, sometimes those experiences can really break down a family. But it sounds like your mom really just decided, this is what I need to do. This is what I'm going to do. Yeah, incredible. And, and you know, she did it in, um, we joke because, you know, my whole family is entrepreneurs, literally every branch of the family tree. And, um, and you know, her parents were entrepreneurs in the... Um, they, they made fabrics. And so they would always say, you know, don't start a business with, with inventory. And then, you know, my dad's business that became my mom's business was in real estate. And, you know, my mom and dad would say, don't do a business in real estate. So my brother and I were left only with technology. I mean, there's not, you know, <laughs> left there. and both of us worked in the family business from the time we were probably 13, 14 years old. So oh, wow. oh, you um, learned from an early age, what it takes. Yeah. To we, and, and when you work in a low margin business, you know, take, for example, office cleaning. I mean, the margins are slim. It's a complete commodity. You know, no one ever says like, oh, that was a beautiful toilet that was cleaned. Like you really learn it's it's the hard, I call it the Olympics of business. You know, you really learn how to succeed in an area where there's so little margin for error um, that, you know, making it, taking those skills and transferring them to another, another industry was, was really, really helpful. Yeah. Tell me when you were little, and you were, as you talk, talked about, being surrounded by entrepreneurs. That's a whole, it really is a different environment than, you know, watching mom or dad go to a company, you know, um, put the card in the clock and come home. <laughs> what were you, what did you want to be? You know, what did you want to be when you were little? What were you aspiring to? Well, if you asked me when I was six, I wanted to be president of the United States. Um, and oh, then I love that. that's a big, that's a big <laughs> that's goal. My standard answer. Um, and it changed <laughs> over time. And I think that's the nice part of being an entrepreneur is that being an entrepreneur allows you to actually dream about maybe, you know, the thing that you want to create, you can kind of create. Now I, I want to be honest about it, which is like, there's a lot of things that you do as an entrepreneur that are not just what you want to do all the time. Um, but, but it lets you, it lets you dream. So there were a couple of times in my childhood that like I wanted to start businesses and I thought of starting businesses. At one point we, we had a, an art show in our house. I thought I would be like a gallery owner <laughs> with my own art, which obviously did not pan out, but, um, <laughs> but you know, it's that constant reinvention that I think led me to entrepreneurship because as an entrepreneur, you are constant, a good entrepreneur, um, or an extraordinary entrepreneur completely can reinvent themselves to adapt to times that are changing. And I think that's probably a key difference between somebody who goes to a company, as you say, you know, puts punches in the clock, somebody else is responsible for the reinvention. Um, yes. you, so come and, and, you can let yeah. it go. Yeah. Right. You, you show up and you do whatever the reinventor, you know, has set forth for you. Whereas if you're the person responsible for the reinvention, you have to have the imagination and be able to have the agility to say there are things about how I think about the world that have to be changed. Yeah. So Heidi, the space you're in really, you know, it, it's the STEM field, it's technology, it's AI, and it requires a certain level of intellect. I will say, were you always good in the math and science in school? Did you lean towards that and did you enjoy it? Yeah. Well, what's funny is um, my brother was not good at school. Um, and, you know, the joke in our family is that, you know, my mom, the teacher who, you know, she went to Columbia for her master's in teaching. And she has this first kid that, you know, is reading at age two and a half that me, I'm the older one, you know, and, and, you know, excelling in school and doing all these things. Then she gets the second kid who like, doesn't want to read, doesn't, you know, and I, by the way, I tell this story because I know there's people who are going to listen to this. His name is Stephen, right? Stephen. Name is Stephen, who either have that child or, um, or are that child. Mm -hmm. And so she was like, oh, well, if he's, he's slow, it's not fair to put him through the same rigor that I expect of my daughter. So they had him tested. And of course, his IQ was like off the charts genius. And as you know, a lot of people with learning differences are. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I was, I was a bookworm growing up. I mean, my face was always in a book. Um, you know, 
I would say the one thing that I am so excited about now is how much more encouragement girls get to go into STEM um, mm-hmm. than, you know, when, when I was younger, it was not like, there was no consciousness of that. So you could kind yeah. of see people like, you know, trickling through the system and it, the funnel getting smaller and smaller. Yes. Um, that's all changed. So, but I, I think, you know, to be good at AI or, or not even good at AI to, to embrace artificial intelligence, which is, in my view, the future, and we all are going to have to adapt to it. It's not necessarily a monopoly on the math and science side of the fence. I think it's having unique skills that are uniquely human. So being exceptionally creative, those kind of people will do extremely well in AI. You don't have to be a math and science geek to to do well in, in the field. Um, you know, to be very good at relating to people, you know, going back to what collective eye does, you know, sales, like relationship building, um, there are things that are uniquely human. And so great AI should enable human greatness, not the other way around. Yeah. I love the way you describe that because I think a topic that it's often just brought to your collective forecast, which is these gatherings of kind of sharing and learning information, um, is the ethical side of it. And that's the greatest worry, I would say, for people who really don't understand and don't have experience in what it can do from a positive standpoint. Um, And we'll talk about that. I do have some questions about that for you later. I want to share, I have a a question from a viewer, and I believe you saw it yourself. I just think this really says who you are. Um, Michelle, I'm going to, I hope I don't butcher this name, Alkerzak, Alkor, Alkerzak from Proofpoint said, oh, how, so. ask Heidi how she's able to make every person, customer, friend, colleague, acquaintance feel as though you are fully and personally invested in their total success. Oh my gosh. That, 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 that's such a nice question. It is um, such a nice question. Well, yeah. Michelle is, is an <clears throat> awesome, awesome person. And if anyone is looking for security software, Michelle is the person to talk to. Um, so I, 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 I don't know. I mean, I, it's really nice to hear that people feel that way. I, I think for me, I'm just a fundamentally curious person. And, um, and you know, I, I read somewhere that people who, you know, regardless of how you feel about Bill Clinton, anyone who's gone to see Bill Clinton speak live, um, they've said that, you know, he looks right through you. He makes every person in the audience feel like they're there. And, and I'm guessing that that's because, you know, people who have extreme empathy, who can really like look and say, get outside themselves and say, I want to understand what makes this person interesting. Um, what what can I learn from this person? And, and I have that view. Like, I, I feel like every person I interact with has something that I don't know. Mm. And so my job is to figure out like, what is it that I can learn from this person? And and I owe them a debt of gratitude for that. Like whatever they teach me, whoever they introduce me to, whatever insight they share with me, that's that's like currency. And so I need to pay them back that debt when I um, when I meet them. So maybe I don't know. Maybe that's why people feel that way. But um, yeah, it's a wonderful nice. testament. And I think it's exactly what you said: getting out of yourself, you know, ego. We you know we could talk a whole show about ego and why it gets in the way and why it, it, you know, it kind of strips people from being authentically who they are. Um, And you do that very well. You're just able to do it. Yeah. And just going back to my mom, I think a lot of, and I I don't mean to generalize because this isn't just a woman thing, but I think women are taught from a very young age to care a lot about what other people think, Mm -hmm. um, you know, and pleasing other people. And you know, my dad used to have a great saying, he was like, you're 10 minutes in anyone's life, like, whatever you do that they want to gossip about, that's 10 minutes, and then they've moved on and forgotten about it. And so are you going to live your life for those 10 minutes and worry about what other people think? Or are you going to live your life the way that you were meant to? And, and I think if you can lose the, the fear of what does this person think of me, and just actually get to the genuine person you are, Ironically, people will actually respond to that in a way that, you know, people can smell out when you're trying to to be fake or phony or try to impress them. And and so I don't know. I, I think that piece of advice really, really helps me. Um, yeah, I, I th- truly think that's the greatest lesson, particularly for young women. And unfortunately, by nature, we, we learn it a little bit later. 
you know? So yeah. I always tell my daughter, don't, I don't want you to wait till you're in your late forties, fifties, sixties to believe in yourself. You're going to do it now right. and be who you are. Be That's that. Amazing. Yeah. Um, so I want to just so the viewers know exactly collective, um, forecast, which I was referencing is a weekly online session um, that brings together great minds across all industries. It's an opportunity for someone like me to come on, which I absolutely love and have the opportunity to ask a question um, directly to someone who, again, just one of the greatest minds in their field. Um, I wanted to, I don't know if you can answer this question. You've had some incredible people. Is Do you have a favorite? Did you have any aha moments of your own during a oh session from one of your guests? Well, for anyone yeah. who wants to join, if you if you want to hear what Sue's talking about, the URL that that sets out where everyone is is um, CI, so it's short for collective eye forecast.com. And um, I learned something in every forecast, but not always from the speaker. A lot of times, so the, the format of it is community question and answer. So, um, and I love when Sue, you come on because you always, oh, we were talking about this in the break, how you always ask such great questions. It's so interesting to me, it's, it's an embodiment of our name. So our name is short for collective intelligence, which is a community generated intelligence. So really almost the featured speaker is the facilitator of the conversation. It's about them, but, it's about like sharing insights and information. So you have somebody who's studied a field, like, you know, today we're featuring the the guy who founded Google earth. Like, I'm so excited to learn, like, yeah. what makes you, like, what did makes you decide to wake up one morning and, and create a map of the earth? Like what, what does that, you know, yeah. we had, you were, you asked a great question of Terry Cruz, who, you know, is one of the most motivational people I've listened to, you know, Reed Hoffman, um, listening to him, you know, talk about the, how they thought about open AI and, and creating, you know, ChatGPT and Dolly and um, Eric Schmidt talking about his days at Google. I, I think, you know, the reason we open sourced it was these are people that you normally would have to get invited to Davos to listen to. And we live in this oh, yeah, age where free. you're normally paying money to be able to, to right. To and and why in, intelligence should be shared, right? It should yeah. be education should be free. Like it shouldn't, why are we hoarding things that could help us create the next, you know, amazing thing. So for me, I've, I've learned, I can't say I have a favorite. Um, I, I think the community is my favorite. It's, yes. it's all the people who come, who, who push the envelope and push everyone's thinking further. Yeah. Um, listen, we're going to go into our first break and we'll continue uh, when we come back. Stay with us for our watch team and we'll be back with Heidi Messer. We are CHOP and we can't wait to show you around. We are the nation's first children's hospital. Now, a care network with more than 50 locations that continues to expand. Three state-of-the-art research buildings with 1.5 million square feet of space. We have grown from 12 beds 165 years ago to nearly 600 beds and one of the best children's hospitals in the world. We have a level one trauma center, 11 floors of patient units, more than 20 operating rooms, first of its kind delivery unit for babies with birth defects, a separate cardiac operative and catheterization suite, and places to learn, like our internationally recognized simulation center. We have trained generations of leaders in the field of pediatrics. We are world leaders in medicine, surgery, and science. One of the top recipients in NIH funding for pediatric research. In this building, pioneers in CAR-T therapy, mitochondrial disease, brain tumors, hyperinsulinism, and other rare diseases. Here, groundbreaking work in fetal surgery, genetics and genomics, and neurology. In our newest building, leaders in social determinants of health, clinical informatics and epidemiology, autism, trauma and injury prevention, our patients come from every state and 115 countries. Meet 
meeting these challenges requires the best and the brightest. We are passionate about pediatrics. We are motivated to make a difference in the world and in our community. We are a team. We are CHOP. Do you stream on a Roku, a Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. Watch Action News Live. And the big story on Action News. Plus special programming, breaking news, and severe weather updates. Tremendous amounts of rain. Always on. Always the news team you trust. Watch 6ABC 24-7 on your streaming device. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the show. I'm joined this week by Heidi Messer, uh, co-founder and chairperson of Collective Eye. And um, I wanted to start this segment and ask you, uh, you've been an incredibly successful entrepreneur. And I was curious what for you is the scariest part when you're first launching something new? Well, it's interesting because before I started, my first company uh, was called Linkshare. Now it's called Rakuten Linkshare. And then Collective Eye. Before that, I was actually an attorney. Um, I went through law school. And um, and you have, when you go into a settled profession, there's a path. Um, you kind of, there's a rule book, you know, okay, if you put in, if you build this many hours, if you can bring in this much business, you'll become partner. And here's, and this is, that's considered success. When you make the leap to go into entrepreneurship, you're actually creating something that, or or I think the most interesting entrepreneurial opportunities are creating something that never existed before. So there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty. Um, There's a lot more failure, uh, you know, and I think a lot of entrepreneurs don't talk about all the failures they have to get to the success. So I would say the scary part is you're you're really leaping into the unknown. There's no safety net. There's no HR department that you can go talk to and say, what's how do I handle this problem? Um, there's no known outcome. And so you have to get really comfortable with the unknown and a lot of moving pieces. Um, you know, markets changing, you know, in our industry, you know, you know, you have a chat GPT that launches and suddenly all the puzzle pieces get moved or, or the chess pieces get moved around to different places. Hmm. Um, so it's, it's that to me that I think is, is the scariest, but, but exciting thing as well. Right. And, and what would you say is your process? So, you know, I, I joke about, I know for me in starting this show 10 years ago, it was almost naive, um, naivete that just kept me going and figuring stuff out. Um, or are you very goal oriented and you, have a strategy and this is what you're going to do to make something work. Yeah. Well, and it's funny that you portray it that way. Cause I remember speaking to you when you were launching this and, and you did not sound like, Oh, figuring it out. You were very directed <laughs> and had a vision. And um, so I think it may be relative to, to other people in your mind, but I, I don't see you that way. I think for me, um, I'm very, a very strategic thinker. So I, my process is you, you, you start with the, you know, a, a mission, you translate that mission into a vision of where you want to be, and then you come up with a strategy. And um, the strategy, I think, can be the hardest part. And in fact, sometimes you don't, you know, do anything before you have a sort of strategy in place. And then you know in your mind what you're trying to accomplish, you know the assumptions that went into your strategy, and you get into tactical execution. And if any of those assumptions that you had change about your market, about, you know, your mission and vision shouldn't change, but your strategy can be adjusted. And so um, for me, that's, that's my process. It's, it's a dynamic process because when you're in a field as fast moving as artificial intelligence, a lot of times, you know, the timing of when you thought things would happen changes, um, the market's reaction to it. Uh, You know, you mentioned, you know, ethical or responsible AI, like, you know, suddenly you're like, oh, this thing is really getting big fast. Like, what are some new things I need to be thinking about um, at the same time? And you start adding things into your strategy. So um, that's, that's my process. Well, I have to ask you, you know, 
In reference to that, the the uh, there was a headline in the Wall Street Journal this morning um, that Elon Musk posted about AI is moving so quickly and maybe we need to slow it down. Tell me what your yeah, take I is saw on that. that, and I'll tell you my visceral reaction to it, which was. Um, I don't think ever in the history anyone has been able to slow down technological innovation. I mean, it, it's a little bit like climate change. Like, okay, you know, there are things you can do to be a good contributor to, you know, the earth's health, but unless everyone in the world gets behind that, it's a very hard thing to execute. So saying to the whole world, like everyone just stop, right. especially when, you know, he's sort of the poster child for like, let's bulldozer, bulldozer over you know, and anything that's in his way. So I, I don't know. I think there's things that I would like people to take a moment to consider. I don't know how realistic it is to say, let's try as a, as a global economy to slow this down, because I just don't have faith that, you know, the Chinese or the Russians or the North Koreans are going to slow down their development. And, and I would not want to be on the wrong side of, of that, right? I wouldn't want to be the one that was technologically disadvantaged because we all collectively said we're afraid of an outcome that could happen and let's slow down. So that, that's my visceral reaction to his. Yeah, it's interesting. When, yeah, at the end of the day, I mean, when, something that will never change is that hopefully I say to my kids all the time, most people are good. The majority of people are good, but there mm -hmm. will always be bad actors that will take things that we're developing and, and creating and use them in the wrong way. That's just a sad reality. Yes. So th the best you can do is can move forward in your lane and, and stay in that positive realm of what you're creating. Totally. And, and, you know, there's so many positive uses for AI. I mean, you know, our, our mission is to make the world a more prosperous place. So I actually want the people that are clients of collective eye to personally, you know, advance their, their goal is to be, you know, more financially successful using our technology. I think there's other uses of AI that are curing diseases. Do I want that slowed down because I'm afraid somebody's going to use it, you know, to create a weapon of mass destruction or, you know, control an entire population? Like, I don't know that you can get the good without the bet. You can eliminate everything. You, you eliminate the good by slowing down as much as you Yes. mitigate the risk of the bad. And the problem with the bad is if you're a bad actor with intent, you're not going to slow down. Right. Correct. So, so yeah. you lose all the good. So I'd be curious as to what, you know, his vision of, of that slowing down um, process is. Yeah. Um, something that you had said that I, I really appreciated um, in another interview you did, you said, I prefer dialogue as opposed to hierarchy, politics, or fanfare. And that to me tells me something about your leadership style. And you know, you never want to be the only one in the room with ideas. So when you think about your role with Collective Eye and the people that work for you, what is at the forefront of your mind to, to keep them motivated and have them feel as though they are very much a part of what you're creating and doing? Yeah. Um, well, look, no. I think a leader's job is to marshal the best resources, both human and otherwise they can to accomplish a shared vision, right? So um, so by definition, I need to be enlisting people that bring something to the party that I don't have. Uh, if, if I knew everything, and I, and I think this, by the way, feeds into the whole diversity narrative, you know, it's not Diversity isn't about charity, right? It's not about, oh, you should do this because it's the right thing to do. Yes, exclusion is the wrong thing to do, but diversity is really about getting the best, most diverse thought minds in a room together so that you can come up with ideas that collectively are better than any individual could do on their own. Mm -hmm. By the way, AI, you know, when you talk about AI, we talk about the diversity of data. Like you have to have a diverse enough data set to be able to generate insights that are really compelling and game changing. And if you don't have diversity in your data, you're not gonna have diversity in your outcomes. Um, I think that way when I bring a team together. So there are times when, you know, maybe I'm the one that has the experience and the judgment to say, hey, that's a good idea, but I've seen it play out and it's not gonna work. But there are times when, 
you know, I just had a colleague who came to me with a, a great idea that, you know, I would ever have thought of. And I'm like, okay, we got to get the team behind it and execute on it. And so it's, it kind of goes back to your earlier question of, you know, making people feel heard. Um, it's not because you're intentionally trying to make them feel heard. It's because you're actually listening. Uh, and, and that's what yeah. I try to bring to, you know, to the teams that I manage is, you know, I want to hear something that's not something I've thought of. And if I'm the one that's bringing all the ideas, then I probably don't have the strongest team yeah. behind me. Well, again, you're doing that well, because as you said earlier, you're, you're, you have the ability to step out of yourself and allow, you know, and curiosity drives that. You genuinely want to learn. You genuinely want to continue to create something that is for Wouldn't the you be collective. bored if you did your job every day yeah, and you weren't correct. learning? I mean, I think you have such a great role, right? You get to hear from all these incredible women and don't you learn something every time you do? Every one time, these? every time. It's a gift, every time. Yeah. yeah. Um, you said entrepreneurs are universally optimistic. And I believe that um, sometimes people will, you know, optimism, they look at it as if it's just a, you know, a sidebar to something, but they don't really understand the importance of that. What would you say about the importance of being optimistic as an entrepreneur? Well, so your odds aren't super, right? Because I think 80% of all ventures fail. So if you don't have some level of excitement for what you're doing, you're going to go into it. You know, if, if I, you know, if I gave you a task and said, um, there's an 80% chance that you're going to fail at this task and you started the task with that, it would become self-fulfilling. So I think you have to have the optimism to say, I'm in that 20%, like I'm already in the rarefied air that's out there. You have to have the optimism to say, um, there's something that the world needs that I can create that didn't exist before. Um, that's an optimistic view of the future. Um, you know, I don't think anyone sets out to create a company. Well, I hope would hope that no one sets out to create a company that creates destruction in its wake. Um, right. You know, and and so I think there's that, and there's a lot of. Um, you know, I, I try to talk about this when people ask me about entrepreneurship, like entrepreneurship can be very lonely. Um, it can be very, it can be exhausting. Uh, you know, it's, it's not all what you read about in, in the media. In fact, you know, when I started entrepreneurs were the people who couldn't become doctors, lawyers, or bankers, like they were, they were the ones that didn't have anything. You know, it's why you saw a lot of immigrants become entrepreneurs um, because they weren't able to break into the established quote unquote establishment. So I think you have to have a view that's optimistic enough that you can see the opportunity even in downside and downturns. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's not, um, that's different than I would say blind. Um, I don't know how you would say it, like recklessness. It's not recklessness. It's not like, Oh, I can do anything. Like I can, you know, change, like remove gravity from the earth. It's not like that. It's, yeah. it's more like, Every every time, you know, it's the the old saying like turn lemons into lemonade. I think entrepreneurs, that's that's their their constant go to place. Like, oh, you just gave me lemons. I can see what I can do with that. Like, there's a resourcefulness that's behind the optimism. Yeah, um, Heidi, if I do, you know what it is in a word that drives you everything that you do. In other words, what if you could wave that wand over the world? what would you like to see change be done? What is it that, you know, um, you yearn for? I think there's, there's nothing more fun than succeeding as a group. Um, so I'm not a person who loves to get to the mountaintop and say like, I beat everyone else. Um, I like, I like to win with a team and, and whether that's like, you know, you can start with, with our country, right? Like I, I want to see everyone in our country benefit from AI. I don't, I don't think it should be a world where there's, you know, five people who, you know, and, and that, I think when you look at, listen to someone like Elon, like that's his fear. And ironically, like he is positioned to be one of those people. So um, I want to see a world where, you know, people are healthier, um, you know, people live longer, people, I, I think we're moving towards a four day work week because machines can do a lot of the things that, I'm you know, all for that. Stress. <laughs> I, I think we all are. And, and, 
you know, I want to see kids that are educated to be able to have highly fulfilling jobs that emphasize skills that aren't ones that, you know, a machine could do, which if a machine can do, then they're probably pretty boring jobs to start with. And so for me, the, the goal, you know, it all, it, it comes back to our name, collective intelligence. Like how do we win as a group and pool all of our resources together so that everyone ends up on top? There isn't this concept of like scarcity and, and, and rarity amongst, you know, people being able to live wonderful, fulfilling lives. Yeah. I, you know, I've always believed that what holds women back, not just women, people, um, is a lack of belief. And I think it's the very first thing you have to get a hold of is, is knowing who you are and believing you have something to contribute or you want to because, you know, you you have something creative to do. So a lot of women watch this show and they're stuck and they... Yeah with all of the resources and support and books and networking groups, everything that's going on right now in the arena of women's empowerment, there's still a lack of, I would say self-empowerment. I don't think you can empower someone else. I, I think it has to come from within. So as someone who's done that, how what would you say to someone listening that might move them beyond two seconds of inspiration and into action? Yeah. Well, I, I think one thing that is harder for women is um, you, you are doubted by more people, right? So, you know, when I look at, say, for example, you know, a, a, a sports team um, and everyone says we want everyone to operate at their optimal level because that's how the team wins. I think a lot of times, you know, the perception or, or the unconscious bias that goes into how a woman's actions are perceived. Like you may actually be trying to help the team win, but it's perceived in, in a different way. So I would say the first thing is to really know who you are, what your strengths are and, and hold that sacred. So there's no one that can take that away from you, right? Like the people who doubt you, um, you know, you, you may not know everything, Right. And you don't have to know everything. We've all heard the statistic of, you know, men will apply for a job with two out of 10 skills. Women need to have eight or nine. Yeah. Um, you don't you uh, you clearly do not need to know everything, but you need to know enough of yourself to say like, oh, I'm I'm, um, you know, back to Michelle's question. I'm an I'm, I'm an incredibly empathetic, persuasive communicator. So I know I would be good at this kind of role yeah. and then kind of let, you know, let people give you advice that fuels that core skill set, but don't let them give you advice that derails you and makes you question your core strengths. Um, and that's a tricky thing to do. I don't, I don't think that's easy for anyone. Um, it's not, it's not. And, and, and there's, and it's because of the noise there's, you know, and, and not only that society kind of teaches us, you know, this is how you do it. Then everybody should follow in tow and do it this way. And so we get pulled to that and then we're losing our sense of self. Totally. You know, and and I think hard. give yourself permission to make mistakes. I think that's, um, you know, when you try to be perfect, they used to say perfect is the enemy of good. I've added now slow is also the enemy of good. Um, I, I think know you're going to make mistakes and know that you can recover from them. Yeah. Like that's that, you know, you're, you're going to fall down. And, and if you try to live your life, I always tell that, say there's two types of people, people who play not to lose and people who play to win. And ironically, the people who play not to lose tend to lose more than the people who play to win. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. you're, you're going to trip, you're going to fall, you're going to get, have to get back you're up. Human. And, you're human. You're human. And there's no great anything, fill in the blank, entrepreneur, um, you know, uh, person in entertainment, person whatever, who hasn't fallen and had to get up and start again. Yeah, yeah. Um, how fun is it to work with your brother? That's my. I work with my brother and my husband, and, oh, and yeah. I am the luckiest person on earth. I get to work oh. with my two best friends every oh. day, and that oh. is, um, I'm so lucky. Yeah, so. they have your back all the time. They have my back, and and I think that is such. I'm, I'm hesitant to to give advice to people because if you don't have that support system, it's a lot harder. That's true. Um, yeah, it's very true. Well. 
we're out of time. Um, I had a whole other page of questions for you that we didn't get to, um, but it was such a great conversation. And thank you so much for taking time um, to share a bit of your story with me here today. I know it's going to inspire someone. Well, Sue, thank you so much. And I am so impressed by what you've built. Um, I saw it in the beginning and where it's come is, is unbelievable. So oh, congratulations. I appreciate that so much. Stay with us and you'll hear from Sherry Morrison, who's going to be with Laura Taylor, the uh, founder of Mingle Mocktails. We'll be right back. It's the number one news at 10 p.m. Action news on PHL 17. Join Shari Williams, Gray Hall, Deuces Rogers, and meteorologist Adam Joseph for all the big stories at a time that's right for you. Action news at 10 p.m. on PHL 17. Hi, this is Sue Rocco. Women to Watch is pleased to share a clip from Breaking Through, a podcast hosted by Madeline Bell, the president and CEO of Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. This interview is part of a series in which Madeline interviews CHOPS women scientists about what inspires them and advice they have for other women interested in pursuing science and medicine careers. My guest today is Dr. Holly Hedrick. Dr. Hedrick is a pediatric and fetal surgeon at CHOP. She is also co-director of a frontier program that focuses on a rare condition called congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Dr. Hedrick, welcome to Breaking Through. Thank you. What inspired you to pursue a career in surgery? I think it probably started with my father. He was a dentist in a small town, and I was his assistant, you know, putting on the little bib. So I think the first inspiration was definitely my father. Can you tell us what is congenital diaphragmatic hernia? Congenital diaphragmatic hernia is a birth defect that happens very early, around the 11th week of gestation. And the diaphragm, which is really the separation between the chest and the abdomen, it has a defect in it. And this defect allows things that are supposed to be in the abdomen, like the liver, the spleen, the stomach, the intestines, it allows them to move up into the chest. About 85 to 90% of the patients we see with CDH are diagnosed before they are born, and we can plan for it, and they are right here at the time. Why did you decide to specialize in this condition? Ah, early on, this was way back in residency. It was considered an unsolved problem, and so I was involved in preclinical studies and really developed a desire. And so that whole spectrum of the disease and that whole life course was really attractive to me. To hear more of Madeline's interviews with CHOP's amazing doctors and scientists, listen to Breaking Through with Madeline Bell, available wherever you get your podcasts. Hello, and welcome to the lifestyle segment of Women to Watch. I'm Sherry Morrison. Today, I have the pleasure to introduce Laura Taylor, founder and chief mingle officer of Mingle Mocktails. Welcome to the show, Laura. Thank you so much for having me. It's exciting to chat with you. It's exciting to have you here. We've been in touch over the years on and off for quite a while now, and I'm excited to let everybody know about what you've, what you've accomplished here and how you've grown. Um, you've done a fantastic job. So you, Laura has developed and launched Mingle Mocktails in 2017. And before we get into how she switched gears and changed her career, Laura, please tell us a little bit about where you're from and your education. Sure. I grew up in San Diego and uh, never planned on living in Philadelphia, but here we are. Um, I went to college at California Polytechnic State University or Cal Poly San Luis Obispo for industrial engineering and dove in using that degree in engineering sales before moving on to companies like Accenture, IBM, and Tableau Software. Wow. There's some pretty big names in the industry. How about that? So you must have done pretty well. Um, in 2017, you made a personal decision to stop drinking alcohol. And you told me about how awkward you felt and how you even made a point to order or bring your own ginger ale. So it appeared as though you were uh, having a good time and you were drinking something with alcohol so people wouldn't confront you as though there was something wrong, which they're so good at doing. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, you're right. So I did give up drinking alcohol and I thought that would be hard, but I found it even harder to go back into those social situations and be stuck with boring sparkling water. So as you said, Sherry, I actually started bringing cans of diet ginger ale to parties so that I could put it in a glass and it would look like Prosecco or something because people would leave me alone. 
So I just, that seemed to be a constant theme, whether at work uh, events or backyard barbecues, you know, people would make comments and it got a little old. Um, so the ginger ale was just kind of a quick fix when I needed it. Yeah, no, I understand. Um, I, I don't drink and, um, you know, I'll go on and off. It's not like something that is mandatory for me, but it's, it's a lifestyle change that I've decided to make. And um, it's funny how when you get to a party, if you're if you just ask for a club soda or something um, and it doesn't look garnished and pretty and everything, people go, what's the matter? Are you OK? Are you sick? Do you have a problem? Do you have a drinking problem? <laughs> it's like, no, I, I've just decided that uh, this is a healthier lifestyle for me. That's all. No biggie. Um, but it, it's it's awkward. So um, then came this big weekend for you away with the girls, how did you handle this weekend so you could feel included and have some fun? Yeah, it was actually, uh, it was a couple things. I was at a neighbor's house for a Super Bowl party and that same crew of ladies, uh, the next weekend we're going away to the Poconos, which was so fun, a girls weekend, but at that Super Bowl party, I got stuck with boring seltzer yet again. And so I thought for that girls getaway, I knew there'd be a little bit of drinking. And that time around, I'm like, you know what? I think I'm gonna make my own mocktail because I'm sick of feeling left out. So that's what I did. I went to the grocery store with my daughter who back then, I think she's around 14, and then brought all these interesting ingredients like fresh citrus and some lavender extract, just different things and kind of mixed around and had some fun and created a mocktail that I put in a one liter glass or one liter bottle and then um, brought it on the trip. So it sounds kind of silly and funny, but what I can share with you was once those corks started popping, I poured this pretty pink concoction that I made into a glass and felt so much better. I felt like I was part of the party. So it was at that very moment that I'm like, you know what? this should be a solution that everybody should have access to because it felt just so much better. So that was a, a real big game-changing moment for me. Yeah, uh, a game-changing weekend. What a great way to fulfill your own and many, many other social void. Um, you felt like you were part of the party and the celebration. It's, it's important. I, I mean, I go as far as when I order club soda or sparkling water or whatever if I'm at a bar. Um, I ask for it in a wine glass without a straw, uh, no ice. And, you know, I, I'm very specific because I don't want people to look at me and say, you know, why is why is she sitting there drinking out of a kitty straw with a big fat lipped glass? Game changing, game changing. Yeah. This is what you've developed. So Mingle Mocktails is born. Congratulations. What was the point that made you decide to really go for this? You had a, a big career in the corporate world and you closed that door. What what? made you close that door and move forward? Yeah, it was, it was, there was a lot of fear. There was fear of failure, fear of stepping away from the comfort of my glorious career that I still to this day treasure. I loved corporate America, but I just decided a couple of things. Number one, I'm like, why not? You know, you can always go back to your job. And that's something my husband and I talked about. He's like, if it doesn't work out, you can go back. And number two, I saw a huge opportunity. I did um, kind of soft pitches with friends in my network who would tell me the truth and say, geez, Laura, you're crazy. But I shared this concept to a couple folks who were like, this is a great concept. I want to invest. So I, I knew I had something and I just decided to go for it. And I've never looked back. That's great. Um, I think your idea, your product and your timing were perfect. You've hit the market when this big awakening and change in lifestyle is taking place. Um, I just read the non-alcoholic beverage category is expected to increase in volume by 25% between 2022 and 2026. That's significant. I mean, I, I have a pretty good list as to why I think this is happening. What's the conversation like on the inside of this industry? When I launched six years ago, I remember having to explain to a Whole Foods buyer outside of this local region why somebody would want to consider a line of adult non-alcoholic cocktails. And fast forward, that conversation has changed where we have retailers contacting us, which I absolutely love. So the trends are there and the data supports it. Actually, 40% of Americans don't drink. And more than half of them are women. So we're all seeking something. And like you said, Sherry, a lot of people just choose to take a break. So 
you know, they're not really like, hey, give me a sparkling water. So let's give them a mocktail. So they do feel part of the party regardless. You know, that's what it's all about is inclusion. Yeah, I, uh, I get it. I, I, and when I really want to celebrate, I, I order my sparkling water or club soda and I tell them to drag it through the garden. So it looks really, <laughs> really special. <laughs> I love that drag it through the garden. That's funny. <laughs> So what are the biggest changes or effects on your lifestyle since you decided to stop drinking alcohol? Well, I, I'm not going to lie. It's all good things. There's not one negative that's come with giving up alcohol. I, I think some glorious immediate benefits were just the quality of sleep was phenomenal. Um, the, the morning after, whether I had two drinks or three, I just felt great. And then the other thing is just being fully present for my friends and family. You know, whether I'm at a happy hour or, you know, late in the night in a lit long evening, I'm fully present and aware of what I'm discussing and who with. And I think that's a huge benefit just overall. That's been great for me. Yeah, I, I think the sleeping is pretty high on my list as well. It's, it's amazing how much just one glass of wine can affect your night's sleep. Um, and I know that it's great when I wake up in the morning and I feel really good but I know it was such a good sleep. I can't wait to go to bed the next night <laughs> and do it all over again. It's, it's awesome. What don't you miss since you stopped drinking alcohol? Um, I, I don't miss feeling puffy or dehydrated. You know, just thinking about the fact that it's been like eight years since I haven't had a drink. I don't think I've been in better shape in my life. Um, I just feel really strong and um, physically strong, emotionally strong. So I don't miss the feelings of just feeling off or, you know, a little hungover or a headache. So I really treasure just good health more than ever these days. Great. Well, let's talk a little bit about Mingle Mocktails. They're gluten-free, vegan, they're natural. You've created, you've created guidelines, I would imagine, to stay within the um, categories. So they're pretty consistent. Yeah. So, I mean, we are not just a little startup anymore. We're in almost 7,000 retailers across the country. Locally, Wegmans, we started out with bottles, but they're launching all cans in all stores in the next month or so. We're at the Pennsylvania Wine and Spirits stores. We're in some Acme's. We've launched in Whole Foods nationally. But really what it is, is a line of alcohol-free cocktails in cans and bottles and five fabulous flavors, like this is the Blackberry Hibiscus Bellini. And these are just fruit forward flavors inspired by top cocktails like the Cranberry Cosmo. And it enables anybody to enjoy a non-alcoholic cocktail, but they're also flexibly mixable. So I love that if you do choose to have a light cocktail, you can add a little Prosecco. We've got recipes on every can and bottle in case somebody would like to enjoy it that way. So in one can or bottle, social drinkers and non-drinkers alike, can enjoy mingle their way. That's great. And I, I really like that the, that you use real sugar and it's not mm -hmm. artificial. So you get that nice, crisp, true flavor. I mean, it has a little sugar in it. It's not overpowering. Um, and you kind of just went through some of your top varieties. I'm, I'm, sh I'm sorry, we're out of time. Um, so what's on the horizon? Well, I'm super excited. Uh, there are two things. Number one, we will be launching a variety pool pack just in time for the summer. So people can sample all flavors of Mingle. And hopefully in the next month, we will be announcing a fabulous partnership with a female celebrity businesswoman who's taken a personal interest in Mingle. So stay tuned on that. Oh, that's exciting. Congratulations. Well, I can't wait to hear more. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time. So thank you very much for being on the show. I love challenges and I especially enjoy hearing how entrepreneurs like you take your own challenges head on and create a solution for many. Thank you, Laura. Thank you so much. Thanks for mingling with me. <laughs> My pleasure. For more information about Mingle Mocktails, story, varieties, recipe suggestions, online purchases, and where they're available, go to www.minglemocktails, that's plural, .com. And if you would like to learn more about purchasing them for resale, write to info at minglemocktails.com. Thank you again for making sure everyone is included in the celebration. Sue so will be right back to close out the show. Ladies, keep living your dreams. Action News, celebrating 50 years with AccuWeather. 
If you think severe weather has been on the rise, you are correct. In the last three years, tornado warnings in our region have shattered records. With 52 last year alone, half of those warnings resulted in confirmed tornadoes, including two extremely rare EF3s. Thanks for always trusting us to keep you informed. 50 Years of AccuWeather is sponsored by Independence Blue Cross. Choose coverage you can count on with the region's strongest network. Is the best vacation one that you find? or when you get lost in. One that takes you to new heights or reminds you to go with the flow. To get your feet wet and your wheels spinning. One that lets you find your own rhythm or get carried away. Find the best of yourself. Get lost in the woods. Plan your stay in the wild woods today. From Philadelphia to the Lehigh Valley, and everywhere in between. For 150 years, Penn Community Bank has been a part of your neighborhood. Helping businesses start, supporting families as they grow, and staying connected to the people and places that make this region special. It's who we are and where we're from. Penn Community Bank, here we are and here we grow. There's a moment. Every hour, every day, every week. These moments shape our world. They add color, perspective, and sometimes pain. Moments are meant to be shared. Shared by friends, family, people you trust. At Action News, we cherish every moment. And it's our profound responsibility to bring you closer to your world. Never miss a moment. Trust the people at Action News. Do you stream on a Roku, a Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. Watch Action News Live. For the big story on Action News. Plus special programming, breaking news, and severe weather updates. Tremendous amounts of rain. Always on. Always the news team you trust. Watch 6ABC 24-7 on your streaming device. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today everyone for another week of women to watch thanks so much for tuning in um, thank you to Katiri our producer and all of our sponsors um, and watch team members for their contributions next week I'm going to be joined by Jenna Carruth um, I'm sorry Carath and she's the head of sports tech at Comcast have a great week everyone and I'll see you next week Now, the Women to Watch, Military Watch. Fewer than half of eligible veterans use the VA health benefits they are entitled to. But those who do use the VA, more than 80% of veterans are satisfied with the VA care. Hi, I'm Carol Eggert, Senior Vice President of Military Affairs at Comcast NBC Universal. Now, you may be asking, why should this matter to me? I share this with you because most of our listeners have some connection to the veterans in their community and may have the opportunity to share information about this new VA benefit. The VA has just launched the PACT Act, which is the Promise to Address Comprehensive Toxics, which is the most significant expansion of veteran benefits and care in more than three decades. Empowering the VA to help millions of toxic exposed veterans and their survivors. The PACT Act expands VA health care and benefits for veterans exposed to burn pits, Agent Orange, and many other toxic substances. The PACT Act adds to the list of health conditions that the VA presumes are caused by exposure to these substances. This law helps the VA provide generations of veterans and their survivors with the care and benefits they've earned and deserve. The PACT Act is the least we can do for the countless men and women who suffered toxic exposure while serving their country, said President Biden during the PACT Act bill signing ceremony. It means access to life insurance, home loan insurance, tuition benefits, and help with health care. So what can you do? Simply refer those veterans you know to va.gov and tell them to search the PACT Act to learn more.